Hey everybody, John Bellamerick here. I'm going to talk to you a little more about Nephew. In the last episode, we talked uh, about Nephew's mission, and um, in this one, we're going to drill a little bit more into why Nephew, why now. So first, let's step back a little bit and think about why cloud at all. Um, people talk about uh, cloud is just someone else's computer. I think that sort of misses the point. I mean, the real reason behind cloud and really virtualization even earlier than cloud is this on-demand API-driven consumption of data center resources. So the idea being that you can uh, separate the planning and provisioning cycles for the hardware from the planning and provisioning cycles for consumption of that hardware, and you can share that consumption across many different work groups and even in the case of cloud, even uh, different, completely different companies. Data centers cover many, many workloads, but they don't cover all workloads. Sometimes you need to have your compute or your storage or your data near uh, a location for some reason. It could be uh, a retail store, it could be a cell tower, uh, it could be um, camera data. You know, maybe you need to do processing near the, the sensor data for some sort of sensor. Or you need to manage a factory and you don't want to risk the downtime that would happen in a factory if you lost internet connectivity. Um, you want local survivability. So large cloud regions can solve many use cases, but they don't solve all use cases. To address those use cases, the industry has as a whole has come out with this idea of multi-access edge compute or distributed cloud, uh, which essentially creates mini data centers, but that also have that property of on-demand API-driven consumption of the resources. So this holds great promise and opportunity uh, for, for um, companies to develop new, new use cases and develop new products on top of that. However, what we've discovered in cloud is that managing cloud itself, even in this, the data center case, is really, really hard. Um, there's a lot of complexity, um, and there have been a bunch of projects that have developed, even uh, in, in organizations like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. There's an entire group dedicated now to this idea of platform engineering. Um, this is all around trying to manage cloud. Even in that case, it's not a solved problem. So what happens when we go from managing a handful of regions to, to managing thousands or tens of thousands of much smaller regions, uh, the problem gets even harder. To kind of frame that or make that a little more concrete, um, this is an image of a few years old of um, Google, Google Cloud Pops. Um, there are many, 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 many more and many different organizations that have different pops. But you can imagine now you're not managing one or two of those yellow bubbles. You're managing all of those blue bubbles and you have different uh, workloads running on different ones. Um, one of the ways we can try to address this sort of broad complexity is to divide up the regions into tiers or the, the sites into tiers. So in this diagram, we're displaying a, a, a sort of crude version of what a, a 5G core, or rather a 5G network might look like. And then here you see the sort of gray boxes are different tiers of service. So you've got on the far right, you've got your public cloud regions, there's maybe uh, tens of them. Um, then you've got some aggregation sites, uh, you have maybe hundreds of those, you've got these pre-aggregation sites with thousands, and then you've got the remote edge or the towers themselves, or base of the towers, or the cabinet, uh, hundreds of thousands potentially. And um, as you want to deploy a complex uh, set of workloads, or, or a particular service requires many different workloads that all work together, um, there's different cost and different power and different uh, capacity um, characteristics of each of these tiers. There's different uh, latency characteristics of each of these tiers. And so uh, you want to be careful about which workloads you place where and um, how you create connectivity between all of those different workloads. So what do we have to do in order to make this happen? Um, there's actually a ton of work in order to deliver uh, a complex set of workloads like that across that geography. Um, even just uh, to, to roll it out the first time, um, you've got a ton of planning to do. Um, you've got to identify the sites, you've got to identify um, 
there's the available sites, there's what's in those sites and what the, the actual physical capacity of the hardware is, there's which ones are applicable to particular use case if you want to say cover a certain geography. Um, you have to decide, like I said earlier, you've got these different workloads with different performance characteristics. You might need, you know, you want to, you want to run as many of them, of them as you can in the cheapest locations you can. The cloud regions tend to be cheapest um, because there there's a, a lot more capacity there. Um, but once you decide where to run them, you have to configure them, you have to configure the, inter the connectivity between the sites, you have to configure the individual workloads to talk to each other. And so even just getting this set up is really pretty challenging, but it gets worse because uh, we don't just set things up once, right? We have to handle changes in the topology. You can have a site go down, you can have a workload go down, you can, um, you can, need to expand capacity in one particular region and bring up a new site. Um, we, may need be, we may be able to get away with the capacity that's there, or we might have to actually provision new capacity. Um, and of course, changes happen due to security fixes and other upgrades. And so uh, day two, as we call it, uh, adds even more complexity. And it gets worse because uh, each of these layers we've talked about, each of these bits of functionality, so there's compute, there's storage, there's intra-site connectivity and inter-site connectivity. Um, there's uh, the individual uh, kernel configurations on the nodes. Um, there's uh, the workload configurations. There's Kubernetes extensions. Uh, there's you know e many different parts of this uh, system that have to be configured, many different layers. And each of those is managed by a different system. So, Deciding that overall topology, maybe you just have designs that you've put together in PowerPoint slides, or you have spreadsheets listing which workloads are going to land in which tier and which cluster. Um, maybe you've got some end-to-end -end orchestration workloads that execute those based upon those, those inputs. For cloud infrastructure, you're going to use the cloud provider's APIs. For networking between the sites, well, you've got these these uh, these routers. You need to configure them. Maybe that's done manually, or maybe you have a change review process. Maybe you have spreadsheets again. Maybe you have uh, an automation tool from the vendor or another um, proprietary automation tool. Uh, again, each layer, different systems. And different systems means different teams. So no individual is going to understand this entire system in their head. Uh, and in fact, we tend to break things up by um, by those layers, potentially. So if somebody understands the infrastructure and can build out the infrastructure, somebody else understands a particular type of workload or set of workloads. Um, we also may break it out by region. Uh, there may be a region uh, that handles this particular workload. So you can see that many different teams are going to get involved. Um, and those teams have to coordinate with one another. So you have to um, agree and negotiate upon uh, all of these things uh, up front. Um, the existing tools we use to provision a lot of these things, like Infrastructure as Code, Hairform, Helm, Ansible, they all require a big list of inputs up front. And those they, they sort of pick up the process once all the inputs are figured out, and then they just execute it. But really, executing it isn't the, the long pole. It's figuring out all those inputs. If you have 100 inputs per workload, you have 20 workloads per site, and you've got 10,000 sites, you've got 20 million values that you have to figure out. They correlate in some ways, of course. So, you know, certain ones belong to a certain region, certain ones belong to a certain site, certain ones belong to a certain workload, uh, maybe to a customer. But uh, managing the complexity of those workloads and coordinating that takes a lot of time and effort uh, in, in, uh, in, between those different teams. So what do we do? Uh, Nephew contends that the first place we have to start is just reducing this complexity, simplifying this as much as we can. Now, this probably isn't enough, these three things, these three big bullets, but this is a starting point, and this is where we're starting. Um, the first thing is unifying on a, a single platform for automation. Now, that, that doesn't mean trying to replace all the automation that's out there. That's effectively impossible. Um, the But it, what it does mean is providing uh, APIs or hooks or ways to access those automations that have a uh, certain predictable behavior so um, and are done all in the same way. Uh, that way, if we're all speaking the same language, we can write automations that can understand the different layers and how they work together. 
Um, the next big uh, bullet point here, or big, big step we want to take is moving to declarative configuration with active reconciliation. So um, what does that mean? That means instead of uh, telling something, um, gathering a bunch of inputs and executing a, a script or a workflow, um, instead we say, here's the state of the world as we want it, and we let the system figure out how to get us from where we are today to that place. Um, you do that by breaking up um, that larger high-level intent into smaller pieces of intent and building controllers that understand the scope of their world and how to measure the current state and uh, actuate the intended state onto that actual state in their scope. And then you compose all of those uh, smaller bits into larger larger scope. So it's a big challenge. It's a lot of work, but uh, Kubernetes in particular has shown how we can do this in in certain uh, areas around um, uh, the types of workloads it works with today. And I think we can we can take it a step further. Lastly, we need to work on this issue of the team coordination issue, and our approach to that is uh, to enable the configurations. That is the the overall uh, manifests that they're used to deploy in that single unified automation platform, the the, the setups in there um, need to be all machine readable, and we need to be able to build automations such that um, we can delegate to teams to be able to independently make decisions in their domain, rather than them having to coordinate ahead of time. So the team that provisions infrastructure can provision a whole bunch of infrastructure can populate a system with the inventory of that infrastructure and we have a mechanism whereby the deployer of something on top of that infrastructure can state how they want to consume it and um, they don't have to interact directly with that that team uh, it can be done through the systems so uh, building out the technology to support that kind of automated co uh, cooperative collaborative uh, type of of workflow uh, is a big part of what we're trying to do. So that's our general approach. Um, we'll dig more into the details of each of these in future episodes, and uh, thank you for joining us.